I'm Tim Tyler, and today I will be discussing the viability of plans to construct intelligent machines by using techniques based on whole brain emulation. I've previously discussed the idea of building on human foundations in my Angelic Foundations essay. Many researchers appear to agree with my assessment that the human blueprint is an unsuitable foundation for development, but some of them seem to think that building on the human brain is still a good idea. The human brain has been a big factor in the progress of civilization to date. However, it seems to me that it is an extremely poor quality component and will probably be among the first to be made redundant by engineering and intelligent design. In my view, the human brain is just as unmaintainable as most other structures cobbled together by random mutations and natural selection are. The effort required to duplicate its functionality in another substrate would be enormous. Other ways of constructing intelligent machines will arrive well before it becomes feasible, at which point few will be interested in pursuing organic brain emulation further, in much the same way that few are interested in building aeroplanes with flapping wings. First of all, let us hear from some of the proponents of the idea of basing intelligent machines on the pattern of the human brain. Here is IBM's Darmendra Moda. So the quest is cognitive computing, which is about engineering aspects of mind such as emotion, perception, sensation, cognition, emotion, action, interaction by reverse engineering the brain. And here is Ray Kurzweil on the same topic. But that'll be the hardware side of the equation. Where will we get the software? Well, it turns out we can see inside the human brain. And in fact, not surprisingly, the spatial and temporal resolution of brain scanning is doubling every year. And with a new generation of scanning tools, for the first time, we can actually see individual interneural fibers and see them uh, processing and signaling in real time. The position I'm going to criticize is that whole brain emulation is a probable route to the construction of intelligent machines. The idea is that we will effectively be able to scan an individual human's brain and then boot it up in cyberspace before other routes to intelligent machines become viable. This is an extreme position. The general idea of using the brain for clues which might help when constructing intelligent machines is a much more moderate and defensible position, and I don't see much of a problem with it. However, here is Anders Sandberg on the topic of how whole brain emulation might work. A rough sketch would be something like this. Uh, you freeze the brain, uh, you slice it very thinly. Uh, these very thin slices you scan using an electron microscope or an, an, uh, some other form of microscope and at a nanometer precision. Uh, you get these images, you process them in a computer to create a three-dimensional model of where are the different synapses and neurons, what are the strengths, what are the connections. You use that to create a, a computer simulation of uh, the brain and then you start the simulation. Why consider such an idea? According to the proponents, the alternatives have less predictable timescales. Here is Robin Hansen explaining that perspective. The hard thing, as everybody knows, is the software. How do you write code that's smart enough to do all these sorts of tasks? The standard traditional artificial intelligence approach, as Nick indicated, is to try to just write the code and make it work. And I was a researcher in that area for 10 years, and I can tell you it's hard. And it, it doesn't look like we're halfway there. It doesn't look like we're a quarter of the way there. Maybe we're deceptive, but it's just really hard, and we've been at it for 50 years. Many people might hope, well, that's all wrong. The standard approach is all wrong. There's better approaches. Maybe we can look at the brain and study it and figure out how it works, and that'll make us be able to do better. Maybe, maybe eventually. We're still a long way off there. So although this may eventually happen through one of these routes, both of these are pretty hard to forecast, and you, it's easy to be skeptical and say there'll be centuries before we can do this. That's a perfectly plausible point of view. It is true that we do not know exactly how long it will take to engineer machine intelligence. However, it seems pretty clear to me that that task will be much simpler than booting up an emulation of the human brain. Here is Robin Hansen explaining the whole brain emulation approach. Take an existing specific human brain and scan it, figure out where all the neurons are and what's connected to what, and then make a computer simulation that's based on that brain with all the same connections and all the same things in the same spots and have a good enough model of each piece, each neuron, each synapse and how they connect to each other so that when you turn on the simulation it's a reliable simulation of the original thing, not that everything will exactly go the same. But One of the advantages of whole brain emulation is that the resulting product has already been trained and does not need to be taken through a long and complicated process of education. Having said that, such training is only time consuming for real world robot controllers. 
If your training data is on the internet or in a virtual world somewhere, then training can often be done at high speed, thus reducing training times dramatically. Another of the advantages of whole brain emulation is that we may not need to understand the macrostructure of the brain in order to reproduce its functionality, since that structure can be copied from a mature human brain by using a scanning process. Here is Robin Hansen explaining that point. A useful concept is the, is the analogy to a software port. So often somebody writes software for a particular computer, and uh, then later on they want to have similar software for another computer. You could rewrite the software from scratch, or you can do what's called a port. That is, you write a simulator in the new computer that simulates the old computer, and then you take the software that ran on the old computer and you run it on the simulator on the new computer, and then you've ported the software to the new computer without having to understand how the software works. So often you have big, complicated pieces of software that nobody is around anymore who understands how it, was, how it works or how it was written, but you still want to run it. And this is a standard practice to be able to run it on a new machine. Alas, I do not think that the analogy between moving a brain to a new computing substrate and porting a computer program to a different architecture through emulation in a virtual machine is a particularly good intuition pump in this case. In the case of porting a computer program to a new architecture by using an emulator, most of the complexity lies in what is being ported across and not in the emulator, or else you wouldn't bother with building an emulator in the first place. If you're building a human brain emulator, the situation is pretty different, as the macrostructure of the brain is mostly produced by a process involving self-organization of the microstructure elements in conjunction with the environment. In a brain, most of the complexity comes from the microstructure and from the environment, rather than directly from the organization of the macrostructure. Also, in a brain, there is not really a natural split between the program and its execution environment. Brain hardware and software are muddled together. A more general argument can be made concerning the extent to which engineered structures are he usually heavily inspired by biology. This argument also weighs against whole brain emulation. The most commonly given example is that of flight. Engineers did not learn how to fly by scanning and copying birds. Nature may have provided a proof of the concept and inspiration, but it didn't provide the details the engineers actually used. A bird is not much like a propeller-driven aircraft, a jet aircraft, or a helicopter. The argument applies across many domains. Water filters are not scanned kidneys. The Hoover Dam is not a scan of a beaver dam. Solar panels are not much like leaves. Humans do not tunnel like moles do. Submarines do not closely resemble fish. And so on. From this perspective, it would be strange if machine intelligence was very much like human intelligence. Next, some economic considerations. So far, machines have mostly complemented humans, compensating for their weaknesses. The first powerful machine intelligences will probably arise from domains where they complement human intelligence under the influence of economic pressures to avoid competing directly with humans. Nor do other economic forces favour whole brain emulation. The brain scanning process gives you a fleshy robot controller, which you then have to find a body for, either in a real or a virtual world. If you look at the organisation's best place to fund and develop intelligent machines, search engine companies, hedge fund, hedge fund managers, the NSA, and so on, then typically they don't want a human-sized intelligent agent, but rather something enormous with superhuman abilities. Whole brain, brain emulation seems like a technology which doesn't work, and so which has no applications, and is not a situation likely to promote funding or research. Next issue is, is that the brain's design is awful. Tell a telephone engineer that he must connect callers directly to each other with point-to-point -point cable connections, and he will laugh at you and tell you that such a system would never scale, and that you should read up on how voice over IP works. Next issue is sociological. Um, humans like to enslave their machines. If machines are people, how is that going to work? I don't think it is. Who is going to buy a toilet clean robot that says its ambition is to emigrate to Australia and become a TV star? Nobody is. Also, humans seem unlikely to stomach the idea of machines being people initially. They will not allow them equal rights and opportunities under law, and similarly they will not allow them to vote. Rather, there will probably be an apartheid situation. The machines and robots will be second-class citizens, and the humans will eventually come to act like parasites on them. Such a situation is likely pro to prolong the viability of humans, thus allowing for a smoother transition where there is a reduced chance of important things being lost. Nor are human minds particularly friendly or safe to be around. Humans get angry and aggressive too easily. The last thing humans will want to have around are intelligent machines that have psychotic breaks. 
So, aside from all the other problems, whole brain emulation is not a safe route to intelligent machines. Frankly, whole brain emulation seems like such a ridiculous joke to me that I have difficulty in understanding why it has produced as much interest as it has. My impression is that the concept of whole brain emulation is primarily a public relations exercise. IBM's involvement seems to be an attempt to reproduce the kind of publicity that they obtained with Deep Big Blue. Ray Kurzweil is a kind of cheerleader for high technology who promotes its benefits to the general public. I can certainly imagine how the public might prefer to hear that they will be able to upload their personalities into the matrix when the time comes, rather than having intelligent machines take their jobs and leaving them redundant. However, it seems like wishful thinking to me. It seems you have a very large credibility gap here. Such a scenario is simply unbelievable, and I wonder whether people are going to be taken in for it, taken in by it for very much longer. Um, enjoy.